I remember being quite young and um, you know car journeys with, with the family and stuff. Uh, I'll always remember there was a, a drifters tape that my mum used to play. It was a cassette, like big fat, you know, double tape. Right, like cartridge. Tape. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> it, it was huge. I always remember it was great front cover, you know, and it was really, really nice. And that used to get played a lot in the car. So and I used to love it, you know, you know, on the roof and Saturday night at the movies and all that <laughs> sort of stuff. Yeah, def those are like my earliest sort of memories of, of music, and I just remember loving it. And yeah. I'm the Beach Boys, actually. Well, that's my stepdad's influence. He uh, loves the Beach Boys, and when I heard that, it was just so like, wow. The harmonies and, and stuff is just so pleasing to like the ear. And it was yeah, just to this day, still absolutely love the Beach Boys. Probably my favourite band. Right. So, any particular track or album? Pet Sounds. Right. Um, God only knows. It's a beautiful, mm. beautiful song and. Uh, wouldn't it be nice? Those obviously those two stand up for me. I do like their sur oh yeah, they're, they're kind of more surfy tracks and you know a bit more upbeat. But yeah, those two just for songwriting purposes, you know, Brian Wilson, just an absolute hero, and genius. I remember one day watching Kerrang, and they used to have this, you know, the, the top ten tracks of the week. And you'd have Limp Bizkit in there somewhere, Linkin Park, all these you know rap rock bands. And then suddenly, the Strokes came up. And the video to last night was on there. And I was like, what's this? It was it looked like something from nineteen seventies. You know, it'd been filmed in a TV studio and it was just like really, really weird. But I, I really liked it because it was completely different and they were doing something completely different uh, for the time when rap rock was around. It was just completely different. Garage rock revival, um, really raw, uh, you know, simple guitars, uh, great front man. Just, just really simple but great raw music and I, I thought wow I really like that so I just started fob the biscuit off straight away after that and I, I personally you know uh, The Strokes they're like my favourite band from then on and, you know, really really good still love them to this day Is This It you know the album it's just completely different to anything that was coming out around the time around the same time as The Strokes I, started, I got into The Strokes because I saw you know cool guitars and you know these sort of old style guitars, none of these like heavy metal, metal, you know, metallic looking things. It was just, you know, a Telecaster and a lovely Epiphone hollow body. And I was like, yeah, I want to play those. They were really cool. To me, that was really cool. So, 2002, I got my first guitar, which was a Squire, a Fender Squire. Not, you know, not the greatest, but it, it looked nice. It was cherry red. And yeah, from then, I just started learning guitar, uh, and that's yeah. I started listening to Zeppelin like a lot. I, you know, I was into Zeppelin from my parents' influence to Zeppelin, but then I started really listening to Zeppelin. And like, oh yeah, that's cool. You know, great guitar solos. Just really wanted to be a rock star. Right. <laughs> and what tracks from Zeppelin and things? What albums and tracks really stood out? Tracks, uh, Immigrant Song. Right. I think it's my favourite Zeppelin track. I don't know why. I can't explain why, I just love it. I think it's you know, great. Massive Viking. Yeah, it's huge. It's like this marching sort of, yeah. Hammer of the gods. Yeah, great, great <laughs> song. Um, no, not really a fan of Stabbing to Heaven, I have to say. Sorry if I'm offending anyone here. But. I think it's almost been heard so much that uh, everybody I know. starts looking at the next things down in the yeah, catalogue. Yeah. So. And it's always the thing, you know, uh, when I was learning guitar and all my friends started also learning instruments and guitar, you know, they, they'd pick up a guitar and try and play Stabbing to Heaven. It was just, it's just no killed. stairway. Yeah, no <laughs> stairway. Just kill, it's just killed the track for me. So. so when you've got it older, established people showing an interest in you when you're 15 and 16, did, did that fill your head up with dreams all of that? All Big of time. That? Yeah. Big time. It really did. We felt like, you know, on top of the world when we played our first gig because we were 15. We're like, yeah, we're doing it. We were, we're only 15. Still in school. And uh, people telling us, you know, that was really cool. And a lot older than us were. Wow. Okay, we can really do this. We're going to go on to great things. We, so we thought, you know, um, obviously a bit naive at that age. Um, also, we uh, we sent a, a demo to. Um, do you remember Toxic Pete? We used to do yes, reviews. Yeah. yeah. We sent a, a demo, our demo in, just on a whim, thinking, oh, you know, it's a bit weird. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> the, wow. The, as it turned out, he uh, listened to it, gave us a rare, like raving review. It was it's just a a brilliant review. 
I've still got it now. I, I've still got my printed version of my ring. First review. It was, it was brilliant. He really, really liked it. It's, and even said at the bottom, you know, I can see this going into something like bigger and better. And that, again, just filled the head up with, you know, dreams, almost ego in a way as well, because we're so young. Even though we'd like been accepted into this particular scene, all pleasure, and you know, it didn't matter what band you were, they'd put you on, and everyone got on, and everyone appreciated each other's music, like you know, most to, it's today. But we were a bit, um, a bit funny about playing some shows because people wanted us. At, you know, we we try and get booked for metal shows, we try and get booked for like uh, post-hardcore shows. And we're like, we're not going to do that because we're an alternative rock. Band. So we possibly did miss out on a few gigs because we were a bit stubborn, because we wanted to play with bands like us. So yeah, I think in that sense we definitely uh, were a bit stubborn, if not lazy, from not going out and trying to find the shows where we might fit in. Like more, maybe 16, 17, I'd, my mum just brought down these great big red boxes. So what's in there? And discovered this vinyl but I'd never seen before that she'd never really told me about. And then, you know, I started getting into vinyl and looking at vinyl and, oh, wow, that's great. And, you know, these, these really old, cool tracks. And, and then I asked my dad, you know, and, and he had he, he did the same. He brought down these big boxes and, yeah, just great, great songs, great albums. Um, and then, uh, but I carried on listening to CD, but now, like, me and a particular friend of mine, and my girlfriend have all started getting back into vinyl. I bought my girlfriend a record player the other day for her birthday. Um, so yeah, I'm going to start listening to more vinyl. I think it's important. Yeah. It's funny, um, CD uh, is not that collectible, but vinyl still is. Yeah. And vinyl's growing. Why, why is that, do you think? I don't know. I, I, really, I really don't know. But it's, I think it's this, it's cool now to, to like vinyl. I'm sure in many years to come, it will be CD's turn again. It would be cool to own a CD because there'll be something, you know, like download, like downloads now. It would be cool to own a CD again one day, you know. Um, but yeah, everyone, I think everyone's going back to their sort of roots and, and it's cool now to have vinyl again. It's cool to listen to it on a record player, but also for the fact, obviously, that um, sound quality, people people prefer sound quality on vinyl. Mm -hmm. Which, you know, I've, I've done music. I did music at university and college. Uh, I personally don't have any preference to what I listen to. It's just if it's good quality, it's good quality. But I don't believe these people who say, "Oh, it's definitely better on vinyl." It's definitely better on vinyl. But I just, I just like vinyl. I think it's, you know, it's it's quite cool. Um, but no, for sound quality purposes, it's never really bothered me. It's never been something I have to listen to that on vinyl. Right. You know, I, I think that's a different subject. You know, I, I just don't don't think it's important. Okay. CD, download, vinyl, it's all, it's all fine for me as long as it plays well, it sounds good. I don't think I've used a hi-fi for many years now. It's, it's just MP3 player or through the phone. Uh, I'm always listening to music on the go. I don't really get any chances to sort of sit down and, and just listen to music. It's all, for me it's always on the go, so it's always MP3 players through the phone. I wanted to be in a band, definitely. Uh, since I started playing guitar, you know, I didn't want to just play guitar as a hobby. I wanted to do something, and I didn't really want to, you know, I, I was start getting into writing, but I didn't want to do it so. I wanted to be in a band. So, 2002, 2003, I started learning guitar, a few chords, you know, scales, whatever, and then um, my friend James Shepherd, good friend of mine. Um, let's start playing bass so we said you know we we're good friends we we're in the same sort of music and said the star band and we had a friend Joel uh, who was you know been playing drums since the age of eight or nine um, fantastic drummer he, like, to this day just fantastic so we got him involved uh, he was like, a good drummer and a good bass as well you know, just, you know, had that and then we wanted another guitarist so we got uh, our friend who's in the year above us, Simon, and we started Fat Boys Are Harder to Kidnap in 2002. Um, which was great because obviously I'd seen the, like I said, I'd seen the strokes on TV, wanted to be different. Um, so yeah, we, we kind of went on the same sort of like wavelength as, wavelength as that because, you know, in, in our year uh, at school and the particular time, it was this sort of 
uprising of emo, sort of the, the emo scene, and a lot of like guys in our year was getting into that, and then there was you had the metalheads in our year, you know, you know proper metalheads didn't like anything else so we in that sense we wanted to be different and we started writing kind of garage rock style stuff and, and very alternative rock like pixies and that kind of influence that fat boys carried on for for years actually we weren't really ever massive on the Worcester scene but we were something different and the thing I like about that uh, particular thing that we were different is we got picked up by all were Pleasure Promotions, um, which was Sam Jones, Craigus, right. um, guy called DJ Genius, dude from, and Ed Steel Fox. And um, we were only 15. We hadn't played our, we hadn't played our proper first gig yet. Remember getting an, we remember getting an email from them saying, you know, come and play a show with us, the, the TJs. And we're like, wow, okay. Yeah, we were so young. I think that was just a really good starting point. For, uh, for the band and got us into a good scene early enough and that just made me you know have faith in, in the band and made me want to carry on being in the band you know what well, I think was just about a great scene we had a real tough time with vocalists throughout our, throughout our time here. that was hard with the kid now we we went through a few I remember for our first gig actually uh, TJ's this is a bit of a trivia for you <laughs> uh, Doug from Peace who's now in Peace right. was our front man Wow. So he's obviously got to do huge things, you know, with peace and with doing so well. But yeah, that was a bit tricky. Doug was our first official singer for our first official gig. We had many a vocalist. We had girls. Hannah Webb was one of our vocalists. Uh, Glenn Burillo. He's, you know, he's got a great voice, fabulous. But we never really had anyone to sort of hang on to. Um, and keep as a proper vocalist with, with quite a few. When Fat Boys disbanded, we uh, started Merry Go Straits straight away, me and James. You know, our, our guitarist from Fat Boys, our other guitarist Simon, sort of was drifting off, it was lost interest. So we, we've never officially broken up, we just mm. run hiatus, if you like. Uh, um, yeah, and then Merry Go Straits started, and me and, me and James, kind of the primary songwriters in Fat Boys, were like, you know. We want to carry on do something else. Joel as well, a drummer was off at starting university, so university is a killer to bands, isn't it? It really is. <laughs> it really, really is a killer. Um, but you know, we got Dan in for America Straits, fantastic drummer. Um, so the America Straits started, yeah. After Fat Boys. With Fat Boys, was you? A, did you feel like you were a leader of the band or part of the band? I think. <coughs> When there wasn't a vocalist around, I felt like the leader, a little bit. Not, I am the leader, it was more of a fitting into place kind of thing. And because me and James wrote the songs, pretty much, you know, Joel would obviously have an influence as well, but me and James would write the songs, Simon would come in and put you know, part on top, you'd say, no, that'd be nice, and we'd do that. But yeah, because I was, one of the top, like, main songwriters, along with James, I did feel almost a kind of a, a kind of a leader, right. and I don't mean that thick-headed at all. It was just a, a natural thing, I guess, to feel because I wrote the songs. Because sometimes when the vocalists around, I did feel like the leader of the band, but that wasn't the case at all. You know, I was just a part. Of the band. And what were the best songs you wrote in the Fat Boys period? What's what's still your favourites now? Where you go? Actually, I'm quite proud of that one still. Um. We wrote, I think, I sort of, by the end of Fat Boys, what we were writing was, uh, wasn't really great. But in, in the middle, we had some really good songs. We wrote a song called OK Go Home, which is probably, it's like really, sounds like the Pixies, you know? And we loved that, it came out of it, and it's just sort of like, upbeat song. Um, really, really good, we're very proud of that. We all are still to this day.